How's everybody doing? Um, it's uh, appropriate that the last video, the first attempt to film this video on the topic of challenge, um, it's appropriate that it turned out that it was became a challenge in order to make it. Um, in fact, it's a challenge for us to achieve anything. Even the simplest things that seem like there's no challenge to it. If you think about it, you had to overcome some kind of challenge in order to achieve it. And that's the topic of this video. The topic of challenge. Why is life actually so challenging? Why is overall life itself actually so challenging? Why, why is it this way? We didn't make it this way. Why did nature render it so? Um, I apologize. I'm back. <laughs> I had to make sure of something. Um, yeah, so uh, we're, the theme of uh, th the topic of today's video is why is there challenges in life? Why is life challenging? And piecing it all together, taking all the factors that are involved in life and coming to an conclusion um, to prove this matter. Let's assume, first, I think it's better if we all assume it's as better for the human mind if we assume that life has an overall purpose. Let's just assume that for sake of argument for those of you who are hell-bent against the idea that life has an overall purpose. Let's just assume it for hypothetical reasons. What would that purpose be? This will force us to think, to have to think as the great engineer of nature itself thought in order to render life the way it, way it is in the first place. So we must ask ourselves, what would that purpose, that innate purpose of life be? To me, there exists a secret level of thought that answers these questions. And it answers questions such as, why is life challenging at all? Why is life challenging to life forms, to all life forms? No matter if you're a billionaire or in poverty or if you are a tree or a ladybug, every life form faces the challenges within nature. Why is this? We must follow all of these observations to the, their natural conclusion. And let's see if we can connect the dots and put two plus two together and see what we come up with. We'll lay down questions such as why are we life here in the cosmos? Why do we exist at all? Why are human beings and everything else endowed with the abilities that each of us possesses? Why do no two species inherently sense the world the same? Essentially, no two species see the world, see existence, life the same. Why is there birth? at all. Why do we have the ability to reproduce and are driven to do so? Why are human beings members of a social species and not decisively solitary beings? Why is all of motion fundamentally involuntary? Take note of that. Even your consciousness, your free will, that is not produced by you. That is produced by nature. Why do we have free will at all? Why do we have free will at all? We didn't give it to ourselves, as I stated before. Why is there death? Let's consider that. Why is there death at all? 
why is it that some actions we choose to do help us and are positive, produce positive values for us, while conversely, some actions that we t partake in hurt us, yet we engage in them anyway, even though we may have knowledge that they produce adverse effects for us. Why is there motion at all? Why is there light when the universe itself is dark? When without that blue sky, the sky itself would be dark at all times, which also lends to that's some coincidence that the sky is blue. For whose benefit is that really? Why are all life forms predisposed to the, to the specific instincts that they are predisposed to, such as to seek pleasure and avoid pain? Why is everything a recurrence? Just more a more complex version as it goes through time. Even science and religion are based on repetition or based on recurrence, if you will. Why are the most capable to make the most well-informed choice? Why are human beings the most capable to make the most well-informed choice out of all species that we know of? We are the ones who are capable to make the most well-informed choices. Why, why is that? That's some coincidence too. This is the reason why I said, let's assume life has all of life has an intention and it will be easy if we put all the answers to these questions if we really consider all these questions it's easy to come to one conclusion it has one logical conclusion if we follow them all the way through their natural thought the answer to these questions and the rest of life's mysteries is that we are we exist in a cryptography we are and even ourselves are our crypto cryptography, the purp a purpose simulation, a game, a challenge that we must overcome. The meaning to life is overcoming the fundamental and innate challenges embedded within its overall challenge for us that it has given to us. It has even made finding the goal to existence challenging and we are under the scrutiny of nature itself being that we are the game's main character this is supported by our low probability and fragility in existence which also means that there are no aliens because there's a very low margin for us to exist that that we even are able to exist at so that, hence there must be, regardless of how much space there is and other planets there are, it, it actually reduces the probability that there are, is other life, mortal life, on other planets. We must accept the fact that as far as we know, human beings and all the other species that exist on Earth are the only life in existence. That is the fact as of currently. And since the beginning of time that we know of. Now. This would also mean that the very me, the, the, the us being evaluated by nature itself would also mean that the very reason for motion is to evaluate the actions of life. Would it not? If we're assuming that all of life has a purpose. Stick with me in this hypothetical here. Though you know I'm not telling, I'm not coming from it, from the context of it being a hypothetical. This is what I'm saying is the truth that exists throughout life. Reality is itself not actually reality. Only to us in our mortal level of reality. We exist. We who exist in the mortal bodies as mortal life forms exist on a mortal level of 
overall existence. There is an immortal level that exists and it is what has produced. It is from that that has produced the cosmos and ourselves and it is in that realm that the universe itself actually actually exists in. The cosmos, you and everything else within the cosmos are only parts of it. You are only components of existence. Once we accept the obvious, we can face the mystery of death courageously. Since life is a purpose challenge, there has to be an overall purpose to the challenge. There has to be a reason for, for creating the cosmos in the first place, for creating life in this mortal rendition in the first place. We must assume it, we must also assume that it is a group challenge, being that we find ourselves not only in mortality, but as members of us individual members of a collective social species. And there must be more to life beyond death. We can assume that there must be more to life beyond death. And let me tell you why. It is hard to imagine death being an easy escape when life itself is so challenging. When so far as we know, all of life is based on challenge. Or what would be the point of birth? If death was an easy, easy escape, what would be the point of birth at all? Just to experience what life is like? Just to experience what challenge is life? What challenge is like? Is, is life a tour? No. It clearly has purpose or we wouldn't have to do anything. We would just have to, we wouldn't be created as um, beings of action. We would just be let be as a tree and just be observers and witness, witnesses of what, of life in motion. But that is not how we find ourselves as human beings, is it? Life has to be, or it has to be that like the fundamental theme of life, death is also a part of that overall recurrence, a part of the overall theme a part of the pattern of the cosmos itself, of mortality itself. Upon death, it must be that each of us pays a consequence or is rewarded for our individual activity slash experience during our lifetimes. As of yet, I am unsure of what happens during what... Excuse me. Challenges. <laughs> They're, we're live. We're live in reality. So challenges are happening. We are live in the reality of the mortal realm. So challenges are happening all the time. Just for me to make this video, I must be alive. And just to be alive, I must be breathing. My heart, my lungs, everything must be working for me to be able to speak this clearly to you and um, hold the camera while I'm making this video. So... Be aware of challenges. Now, as I was stating, it must be that each of us pays a consequence or is rewarded for our individual activity slash experience during our lifetimes upon death. As of yet, I am unsure of what happens during that duration in between death and returning to the cycle of life. I'd imagine it would be an adequate punishment of some kind, by nature standards. One such as having human memories while living in the body of a tree, insect, or of some other animal. Let's not forget the very fact that nature has included pain and suffering as a part of life is something that it allows. It was 
pre-programmed into nature to allow to happen. So you must also look on the punishment from consequence of our living, of our actions while we live, to be on that same type of level, something painful, something that will be of suffering. I believe that's the reason why Dante came up with the Inferno in the first place. It's because a lot of previous thinkers saw, noticed that there were certain things happening in life. That's the reason why you've heard of reincarnation before or why we came up with chess because we realized that we were within some type of game that every action was of consequence just like in chess that's what I like about that game that every move that you make in chess is one that is of consequence and that's the same way we are to view life now the process of death moving on excuse me the process of death must also require finally a return to life again and again until we achieve the overall objective of our very existence in the first place let's not forget we are innately immortal we are an inherently immortal at the fundamental level don't look at life from a mortal perspective that is why I say we must reconcile objective life the objective world with our subjective views because inherently what powers you not mortal energy but actual energy and energy is what it has no beginning it has no end it is immortal it is forever it, it never have it had a beginning or an end that's the reason why we shouldn't look for God having a creator or creators behind creators behind creators repeating like 3.14 it's, that's not how it exists. God, the great deities, because there is not just one singular being, because we are also in the cosmos and we are also immortal, existing previous to the mortal realm, existing previous to the cosmos. So God, the creator of the cosmos, the creator of this prison that we find ourselves in, a prisoner in our own minds are in our brains a mind within a brain a brain within a body a body on earth trapped on earth an earth trapped within a prison of the cosmos we find ourselves that way because for a person for a purpose and that purpose if we allow our minds to pursue this line of thought of why life is such a challenge must be that we committed some infraction that was worthy of us being put of us being placed within the cosmos within this mortal realm in the first place and that's the reason why we know there must be another at least accomplice to this whole or catalyst to this whole sequence of life that exists outside of the cosmos that is obser observing us because we are not evaluating ourselves We are not um, the creators of our own suffer, uh, our own mortality. All of that is involuntary. Remember, I stated that your birth and your self-preservation, even your free will, or the fact of that you are going to die one day, that is all involuntary. No part of life is really voluntary if you think about it. Even your free will, your consciousness is something that nature endowed you with you have to be brave and face the reason as to why face the question as to why this whole thing is about pursuing natural questions questions that you've had since birth who gave you those questions who gave you the ability to question who gave you your all of your innate abilities in the first place who who limited those abilities to what they are limited to at all? And why did they limit them? That is how you will come to the truths of what life is all about. Now, admittedly, I haven't pursued all of the questions because, and I shouldn't have to. Because as I said, stated, I was made innately. 
as a member of a social species. This isn't just for me to do. I am just doing my part that nature has laid out for me to do. I am trying to create val value for myself, my innate value for myself. Try to reconcile all of what I have done wrong in life previous previously to this in my experiences. And that is what we are all supposed to be seeking to do. We're seeking improvement. Don't forget you're born with a blank slate and you die with much more knowledge than you were born with. Why is that? Clearly life is about improvement. Notice physically you developed you develop into what you will become, into adulthood, into a physical maturity. You're fine. Um, also notice that that's the same way it is for control of your body parts, control of your appendages. At first you start out with little control, with basic control of them, just the ability to twitch your arms and your legs. And then eventually you develop to a point that you improve or excuse me, you improve to a point that you have full control of your arms, your fingers, your toes, and your legs. We must also, therefore, it is. We must also assume that the same must be for our minds. The same must be for our thinking. That's the reason why we have memories, to be able to learn from them. That's the reason for mistakes and failure. There is value in these things more than there is within success. That's the reason why everything affects each other. Because everything is coherent. We're all points on a map. Points on a game. We're all points in a green screen. That is exactly what I'm saying. That life existence itself is a green screen. It's all an illusion. But this illusion is very real as to its consequences. It has a purpose. Nature is making a point to us. And we must face that challenge no matter how poetic and romantic it may be to try to ignore it. You cannot ignore nature. Nature might have given you the ability to ignore it, but it did so for a reason. And, I, and you can be certain that that reason is not to help you achieve the objective of its challenge that it's laid out for you. Don't forget what Steve, Stephen Bowden last night, Bobo, who we uh, affectionately call Bobo, said last night. It's all about the legacy we leave. You have to leave the world better than you found it while you're alive, or you are you because we're first doomed to return to it. And second, because then you're going to have to once again exist in the very conditions that you help make. That you help to create. So you have to begin to ask yourself the questions of why are you here? What is your life for? What are you purposed for? Is what you're doing now really what life is about? Is pleasure and emotions really what life is supposed to be based in? Is that really what your innate fundamental objective of being a living thing is? You have to dare to take your mind to the fulcrum, to the borders and the heights and depths that it is capable of thinking at. Uh, a person named Michael Holt, he constantly trolls me and says, well, how can you say that you're the highest level of thinker? I'm about to show you why. I can say that I am the lowest level of thinker and at the same time the highest level of thinker in recorded history. First off, Alan Watts is a simple is a sim, think similar to me. And I've never known of Alan Watts until three months ago when Stephen Bowden and then subsequently after that uh, my friend Adam Stuck brought him to my attention. I never knew of Alan Watts before that, but I noticed once, once he was to my attention, I did notice that he had some ideas that were similar to mine. But still, I was unimpressed with him. And let me tell you why. Because he did not solve the problem. He did not solve the problem of existence, of why we exist. That's the reason why no thinker before me actually impressed me. Yes, some of their ideas impressed me. But they none of them actually solved the problem of life. So how can I say that they're the greatest thinker, no matter how great their thinking their, some of their ideas were? That's how I viewed 
the thinkers, previous thinkers before me. Now, the second reason why I can be the, I can say that I'm the number one thinker in recorded history is because I am saying that Alan Watts and I are echoes of previous thinkers before us. And also those previous thinkers had to exist before recorded history, before recorded history. The only other clue in recorded history of thinkers that were thinking of the at the fundamental truths, the level of fundamental truths of why there is, why is there all motion? Why is, what is the reason for all of motion? Is the story in the Bible of the Tower of Babel, the people coming together and realizing that they were thinkers and trying to use their minds to reach, to reach the level of God's thought. That is the only other story that, that, to my knowledge, of people thinking at the heights that I currently think at. The only reason, um, also, I do believe that the thinkers that did think at the level that I think at now, the objective level, what I call axial thought, because it is what the, the level that the world turns on, that life turns on, it's not something that I invented. I repeat, I did not invent this. It is something that is embedded within nature. It exists all around us for anyone who dares to use their mind to think at that level of thought that they, each of us is capable of to discover. It is a connection, a network, a structure of intention. Just look at every object and motion in life and there you will see if you can take the time to really consider it the intention behind each of why each exists now what I would say is I noticed that the word genius and Jesus and the name Jesus have bear a close resemblance and that is what I think that Jesus to me is if we, we, we what we know from the Bible is that if we if we look past all of the superficiality of the Bible, all of the, the the decadence of the Bible, and just look to the fundamental of it. We will see that it's a, as Christopher Hitchens once said, it's a book of, and I'm going to paraphrase him a little, that it's a book that highlights human behavior, even then. And... If we look at it from that context, Jesus was the first protester. Jesus was the first protester. He's the most, or excuse me, the most famous protester. That's what I should say. Jesus is the most famous protester. He protested against the nation state. He protested, protested against the tyranny of the leaders of being done by the leaders of human society against the masses of people. And if you look at life since, how it's developed since we think that we are developing or progressing in some kind of way and evolving but it is only socially if we're going just based on the bible alone or even what socrates gave as a reason um why he was against democracy people have not evolved socially we have not evolved um in thought mentally regardless of what you may think of the enlightenment the enlightenment I don't even think should be called what it is because it really did not solve the problem the problems of society Einstein for all his brilliance same thing with Stephen Hawking for all their brilliance they solved mysteries of outside of ourselves if a mosquito is biting me I am not going to look to space to solve the problem. I will look to where the mosquito is biting me and look there to render the situation solved, to bring it to resolution. So I'm wondering why Einstein, who lived during World War II, and Stephen Hawking, who lives in the tumultuous times of now, have not looked to solve the problem of human society. Do they, do they think that it is beyond the realm of science? And for some reason, science does say that human life is beyond its scope when in in fact no it is not everything is mathematical everything is logical everything is coherent the same laws that affect space affect us here in human society as well everything is 
innately predisposed a certain way. That is the reason why I say regardless of your race, religion, uh, gender, or, what, or whatever other artificial biases that we've been conditioned to accept about ourselves, every human being shares in the same nature. There is something that is similar in all of our behaviors. There is something that we are all innately predisposed in our way of being. And that way is what I call the real, the actual human culture. Not this artificial thing called Chinese culture and American culture and whatever religion and that religion. None of that is real. What is real is what we're actually... Uh, thank you. Yeah, what's actually real is how we are. Oh, that's your actual neighbor. That's how he wakes me up every fucking morning at 7 o'clock. Oh, wow. Just out of my fucking bed. I'm like, you motherfucker. I thought that was the actual TV. No, it was my neighbor. Oh. Oh, okay. <coughs> so that's how we have to look at life as to... So that's the reason why life is challenging. I'm going to take that as my cue to end this video. I hope you got something out of it. And as I said... Um, oh, you know what? No, I'm sorry. We haven't finished as to why I believe that I, why I say that I'm the world's number one thinker in recorded history. Um, it is no coincidence to me that we live in the information age. And it is only right that being that we do live in the information age, and I'm a person that is, uh, also lives in this age, I have the luxury of seeing of being able to look back in history of thinkers, of our thinkers in the human history and see what they thought previously before my mind came into existence. I have the luxury of able, being able to filter through what actually makes sense and is coherent to actual nature, to the machinations of the rest of nature and what actually is just seemingly profound, what actually is really superficial and only sounds good. Never before has there been a thinker in history that has had that luxury. Is that not true? So, yes, Spinoza was profound. Yes, Socrates was profound. Yes, Descartes was profound. Yes, David Hume was profound. Yes, Lao Tzu was profound. Yes, Buddha was profound. Yes, Jesus was profound. Profound. Yes, Martin Luther King was profound. Yes, Malcolm, excuse me, El Haj Malik Shabazz was profound. Yes, um... Harriet Tubman was profound. Yes, Joan of Arc was profound. Yes, Gandhi was profound, etc. But none of them before our generation has had the luxury of being able to piece together all of their thoughts as well as what's going on in my experiences of every day and the current events of the modern day and put it all together and lay it out as a math equation and work it to a conclusion and put it to a sum make it into a render it a, render it a linear equation no other pre thinker previously to myself has had that luxury that is a fact the next thing is I don't know of anyone else that's existing currently that has taken that tact in trying to solve the truth of life if you know of one, please send him my way. I will happily change notes with him, exchange notes with him to see. So if I'm the one that it, within the information age that is taking actual advantage of the fact that no other mass of the general population previously to us has had the luxury of having access to free access to the information that we currently have access to within the information age, then I hope that explains the reason why I do say with a surety and a certainty that on one aspect, I am the littlest thinker, the most benign thinker in human recorded human history because of the, the journey I had to take in order to come to this line of thought, in order to get to this line of thought. 
But at the same time, simultaneously, with life being a duality, with life being an inverted, constructed duality, I am also, whether you like it or not, without any degrees, without having to go to the Ivy League, without any pomp and circumstance, just simply with my mind and utilizing what nature has given me, the tools that nature has given me. I am these, the deepest and highest thinker that exists in recorded history. I have solved what life is all about, why life is challenging. After the argument that I have just laid out, Please, if there's someone else that can give a better idea of what life is about, I'm all ears and willing to listen to it. But it must be as coherent as what I've just laid out. It must be as what exists in nature already. I did not have to point you to faith. I did not have to point you to some complex explanation. I use simple terms to explain the simple existence of how life is a math equation. And how it is set up coherently in a logical coherence. And that the very point of our existence is overcoming its challenge that it, it, it has innately laid before us and innately given us the tools to be able to overcome. Thank you. Have a great evening.